Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great to see you today. Thank you for coming out. We welcome folks who are here in the sanctuary, and we welcome folks who might be at home or elsewhere listening or watching. So glad that you have joined today. I have not yet reviewed the announcements and the bulletin. You can do that by looking in the center section if you're here in the church. And I know this is still a little loud. We'll get it. But, uh, and are you hearing me so far? Okay. Um, but the biggest announcements today are probably the passing of, of people that are dear to folks here in the church. Uh, longtime member, Miss Patsy Foxwell, passed, was it Thursday or Friday? Thursday. And the same day, uh, Pam Laverty, a friend of many people here in the church, also passed. And Bev has added, and I hope we're allowed to say things on the radio, that a neighbor, Jay Aldridge, has passed in the last yesterday. So we've, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of loss and, and grieving, and uh, we want people to know. We want people to know that uh, Pam's funeral service is today at three at Thomas Funeral Home, and that visitation is starting one hour before that at two o'clock. So Pam Laverty's service is actually today. Let's also look at our bulletin. You've got a note on offering envelopes. You've got a reminder about corporate prayer on Wednesday nights. You've got a notice about One Mission Cambridge and the hunger ministry that this church does with other churches. And I believe from the recent business meeting that was this week that there's several opportunities for volunteering. There's like two different things, a regular thing and a special... I'm sorry for just using the word thing, but... uh, And so you can see that. And let me just ask, since I didn't really prepare for announcements, are there some announcements that you know need to be made this morning? Okay. You know, let me ask a question. I don't see Steve. So when we get to that, is he here? Okay. Um, So uh, if you would... Would you please stand and sing two hymns? We're going to sing the first and fourth of both There is Power in the Blood and Are You Washed in the Blood, 225 and 229. Let's stand and sing together.
you. Please be seated. So one thing I should have said right up front, which would have occurred to me if, if not for needing to share these losses, is, and it's pretty obvious that uh, Chris and his family are away today. Pastor Chris and his family are away. They're in Florida at a conference. He, he has, we've heard from him during these losses, and he's been trying to know what uh, is, is needed and what to do, and has been in contact with other people. And he has said that the conference has been very meaningful and very uplifted, and he's excited about that as well. And so Chris and Danielle planned to be watching us, perhaps live. They'll probably watch not live if, if, they, if they can't, but anyway, we say hi to you, Chris and Danielle, and uh, we're thinking of you here, and we're thankful that prayers have already been answered for safe travel and for this to be a really meaningful time where you are, I think, in Fort Myers. So uh, that's partly what's going on. Um, we've lately been having a psalm, a reading from Psalms uh, at this point in the service, and the person who was going to read it is not here. So either I'm going to read it or somebody's going to read it. <laughs> and we'll go with the translation we have in the pew. Psalm 4. I'm usually faster than that. Was the intent, Susan, to read the whole psalm? Whole psalm? This is Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Selah. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Selah. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's stand and sing 160, Just When I Need Him Most.
Thank you. Please be seated. Ushers. Father and our God, we come before you in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have made a way for sinners who are worthy of nothing, Lord, but your wrath and condemnation. You and your grace and goodness have made a way that we can know you and love you and enjoy you forever. Father, we thank you that Christ's work on the cross is finished today, Lord, in your people, and it is victorious. We pray, Lord, that these provisions which you have given to us in the form of money, Father, please be glorified in our giving of them back to you. And please use them, Lord, to glorify Christ and make the gospel known here in Cambridge. May your people be edified, Lord, and please may your name be made great in this town, Father, and going out from there to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeing you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all.
let's let get let's get the, let the choir get in. Beautiful words to the hymns today and the songs. And uh, let's just pray for a moment. Lord, we would ask that everything now would be worship in spirit and truth and everything that is said and everything that is heard. In your name we pray. Amen. So, uh, to start today, I've sort of got like four ingredients uh, to this message. Um, And uh, one of them is a a quick reference to uh, a C.S. Lewis uh, title of an article, which is called Meditation in a Tool Shed. And in that, he talks about a beam of light coming into a tool shed, a little bit of dust in there. And he talks about how you can look at that beam of light from the side, or he talks about how you can look along from from outside, I'm sorry, or you can look along that beam of light from inside. And that what you see is different depending on where you're standing. And he wrote that to kind of talk about the fact that the scientific world and the secular world want to... uh, undermine in some way the value and legitimacy of being inside things, especially spiritual things, uh, by only looking at them from the outside. But today, I hope that the tone of this message is that we are going to look at faith from inside of faith. We're going to talk, we're going to look at whatever these verses are and whatever our topic is, we're going to look from inside of faith, consciously and purposely. Faith which, as we know from that Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, is the gift of God and not of ourselves, without which it is impossible to please God. It is specially mentioned as one of the important three, faith, hope, and love. And we know that we are saved by grace through faith. Now, I'd also like to say a little poem for you. It's in its, in its correct form, it goes a little bit differently, but a person who I loved and loved me and, and was a mentor in, in, in aspects of faith taught it to me this way. Three men were standing on a wall, feeling faith and fact. Feeling took an awful fall, and faith was taken back. So close was faith to feeling that faith fell down too, but fact remained. And pulled faith up, and faith brought feeling too. And all you're hearing there is that there's three important things, and I'm not minimizing faith in that. But what's the first thing and the most important thing? That God is. That God is and who God is. And then of huge significance to us is faith. And then, of course, we have our feelings. And what we really want is to strengthen what we know, to strengthen the faith we have, to guide the feelings that we feel. And we want the influence to work in that direction instead of the other way. We want our feelings to be influenced by our faith and our faith to be based on what we know and, and, and not the other way around. I hope I said that right as I hurry. Um, and, and so, and also I'd like to say that, you know, over the years our church has not had, we sometimes say this, we reflect on like, what kinds of folks have we had in this church? And one thing we used to have and, and we still might have is we used to have a lot of people who were Uh, mental health nurses or psych nurses, and we had teachers, people who really understood both learning and people who understood the importance of, you know, the integrated health of the whole person. So those are two things I'd like to share as a preface. Two, Two more things I'd like to share as a preface are that we're in a time in our church where we have a new pastor, and he has had a certain way of saying things and sharing things. He has helpfully made a point in in one of his devotionals before he came here and in Sunday school of talking about how the unified gospel can kind of be seen as a gospel of salvation and then a gospel of sanctification where the second is sometimes neglected in a way. way. Uh, If I'm using words for, for easy shorthand now, I'll say gospel of salvation 
our rescue in through by Jesus and sanctification becoming like the Jesus who rescues us. Chris has an emphasis on glory and focus and insight into God's design and purpose. He is a believer in strong foundations, and he has a solid, he tries to have a solid theological, and he does. And he, I think, is trying to help us be very God-centered. I think I'm still processing both in friendship and in being in a congregation some of what is shared. For some reason, at this moment, I feel like saying, and I don't think this is, I, I don't, would not even know who to credit this image with, but sometimes people talk about two towers when talking about God's attributes. One is his justice or holiness or his righteousness, and the other is his love. And even though he totally is both of those things, like we would say in Sunday school, and even though they're totally integrated, to us, when we look at one or the other, it feels like there's a tension between them. And it's the cross that integrates them or harmonizes them. And in fact, it has the effect of having the one attribute of God even show us again how amazing that other attribute is because the cross shows us that something like if a holy God, uh, we can think to ourselves, a holy God must love us a lot to do that to save us. Or we can think he must be, our loving God must be awesomely holy if that's what it took to save us. And finally, as preface thoughts, we are grieving, even though we have confidence. We're grieving the loss of Miss Patsy and many people in the church of Pam who were Christian friends of theirs who had lived inside of the faith that we're talking about today. So as I get into the body of this for a minute, I'm going to initially emphasize verses. No, I don't want to use the word emphasize there. I want to say I'm going to have some verses. And kind of what I'm doing here is, is that if there are verses that God has repeated or, or, and or emphasized throughout his word, Old Testament and New Testament, that's a, a thing I'm going to pay attention to for a minute. Now, there's so many, and every word of the Bible matters. But here's a section from Mark that is emphasized in part or in whole in several other places, and it's central. Mark 8, 34 through 38. I'm probably just doing 34 and 35. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he, Jesus, said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, pick up his, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Apparently, and I'm not a person who would know this from languages, but apparently when Jesus says come after, the Greek word means something akin to or close to, to come to a point of being with him. And some people have described this notion of taking up your cross or denying yourself as two aspects of it have been described as putting thoughts to death that are un unpleasing to him before they reach the heart, and consenting to suffer or sacrifice in whatever way for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of identifying with Jesus, and, for ident of, and of identifying with his good news. But I think Paul in Philippians 3, 7, and 11 really shows living inside faith himself. He shows uh, what this taking up your cross and denying yourself can look like. And I will probably read this whole package, passage of Philippians 7 through 11. But everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. I think I probably meant to stop shorter for the sake of time, but somewhere in there, there's a personal pronoun, my. It says, uh, my, 
the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I checked a couple English translations to see if, if that my was there. And I know that that my doesn't mean that I own him. It really means that he owns me. And Paul in the next passage says, not that I've already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. So that's taking up our cross and denying ourselves and following, following him. Following is a relational inside faith word. Jesus says this my, in John 10, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish ever. So now we've kind of set the table of following, walking with the Lord, having a relationship with the Lord. And I hope the whole message isn't nonsense, but you'll help if you reflect on your walk with the Lord as we talk and cover verses and share things. And if you reflect on what is meaningful in the example of others in their relationships with the Savior. Uh, and there could be people here who are not inside faith right now. And I meant to say earlier that, you know, that is wonderful if, if, if you are here because you are open to something, because you sense something. Uh, a, a lady uh, who I have come to, well, I truly respect uh, from a different denomination, even though they don't think they call themselves that, talked about one of the themes of, of her understanding of her church, uh, church's approach to things is called the deeper life. And I asked her, what does that mean? She said it means in the sense of spiritual maturity, sanctification, and holiness. Now I want to go to another New Testament, Old Testament, repeated and emphasized verse. And it's one that Chris has, has of course, talked about in recent days because it's when Jesus answers, what's the greatest commandment? And I'm in Mark 12 here. This is the most important, Jesus answered. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Deuteronomy's version, in some English translation, uses the word all your might as part of it. Luke, in some translations, has all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And there are words that are needing to be translated that involve both the head and the heart. John Piper, in his blog, Desiring God, said this, The mind has not yet loved until it hands, until it hands off its thoughts to the emotions where they're embraced. And then the mind and the heart are working in what feels like such harmony, and you experience it as both intellectual and affectional love for God. Where Chris and Danielle are is, can I say that, at the Founders Conference, or at a, at a, at a, at a conference that is put on by an organization called Founders. And one of the prominent people in that organization is named Tom Askell. I think Chris knows him, or has at least met him. And in one of his posts, he wrote... Jesus' answer, Jesus' answer to the question, what's most important? Jesus' answer gives the point and purpose of the whole law. He summarizes our complete responsibility in terms of relationships, specifically our relationships to God and to people. The essence of all relationships, he says, is, is or I'm adding the words in here, to be, is to be love. How much does he love us in this relationship? And a, one example from the life of Jesus comes in John 13, 1, when he's about to go to the cross, and he's spending precious moments with his disciples. And this short verse says, Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And when you read to the end, well, Lange, you know that things aren't final with, with Jesus. He's going to be resurrected and all that. But apparently... The best way to translate that is he loved them to the fullest. He loved them completely. He loved them always. And I, and I think it's not wrong to say that the same way in his high priestly prayer of John 17, he prayed about himself and for himself, and he prayed for the disciples that were there, and he prayed for all those who were going to believe through them. 
I think it's fair to say that he loves us fully inside faith, fully, completely, and always. And here's another love verse while we're talking about commandments. Jesus in John 13, verses 34 through 35, actually says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And I'm wondering if people, when they read that, it's like, is that a new command? He said, love your neighbor. But, but there's two, two aspects to that. The, the who one another, I suppose, is within the church family, but the one that's standing out to me is that Jesus says now, come to earth to show us what God's love looks like. And he has loved people in that true example. And he's saying, love each other like I have loved you. And we'll say later in this talk that these are high, impossibly high, except for all things possible to God, standards. But I'll tell you while we're talking about love, that anyone who knew Miss Patsy, even a little bit, only had to ride on a bus with her, ride on her bus, See her interact with, with you or with other children. I think I wanted to ask someone before the service to, to serve on a Lord's Supper committee with her. I think. I think that was one of the things she did. You only had to do that. You only had to ride on her bus to see her spread love out of love for the God she knew loved her. Okay. Back to being inside this faith relationship, this walk, this following. There will not be time in this service for me to touch on as many aspects as I wanted to prepare during the week. I'm going to choose one. I'm going to choose children of God. I hope God chose it. <laughs> children of God. And in Mark 10, 13 through 16, it says, For to such belongs the kingdom of God. And, 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 and Jesus was talking, this was what was happening here, it was, the, it was one of the scenes with children. And so he says about children, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. What are some things that we sort of feel intuitively that we know about a child? A child trusts the one who loves him or her. There's sort of the classic picture of a child standing on the side of a pool and a, and a father waiting to catch the child. A child also wants to please the one who loves him or her. Another verse with children is Mark 18, 3, where Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, if you're children, then there's a parent. And God has characterized himself as a father, and in certain places in the Bible, Christ spoke to the Father, and sometimes he used the word Abba. And the best I can tell this week is that, and I, by the way, have had friends who were from Israel and heard children calling their father Abba. And one of the things I think I can see this week is that Abba has both an intimacy and affection, while also having kind of a, like a respect for a loving father. It seems to have both those aspects. Here's Romans 8, 14, 17. All those led by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Jesus, I believe, addressed the father that way. Uh, in one of the key examples. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Did I say this in the early going? When I mentioned that Chris causes our ears to perk up to certain things, glory is a word that I see so much more sharply in reading the Bible because of the emphasis that's been placed. And so every time I see it now, I'm like, huh, yeah. 
Galatians 4, 4 through 7. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Here's a favorite verse of mine. A favorite. I don't know how you pick favorites. A favorite. Probably cry when I read it. Somehow it says something to me. It's when Jesus has been resurrected. And one of the Marys probably. I think it's, I think it's Mary Magdalene. Has gone to see him. And she hasn't recognized him yet. But we, we, we've already read that his sheep hear his voice. And all he has to do is say her name. And turning around, she says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Here's what I wanted to read. He says, don't cling to me. I don't mean it sharply. I mean, he says, don't cling to me. Jesus told her. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father. To my God and your God. At the moment of his resurrection, my father and your father, my God and your God. But to all, John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Another verse in a letter of John instead of the gospel of John, but the same John. 1 John 3, 1 through 3, I think I'm just reading the first verse. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. You could spend time talking about how Jesus also used the word friend because he made it possible to be our, for us to be his friend. You could talk about how he made us able to be citizens of his kingdom with the benevolent ruler that he is. We could talk about abiding and remaining. We could talk about how he knows how to give good gifts. We could talk about the tone or the feeling of the relationship, the gentleness, uh, the example and the lessons, the promises, the sense of true redeemed identity. He knows the hairs on your head. You do have a new name written down in glory. He says that his I'm trying to figure out the right way to say it to be fast so that makes me slower. He is gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Here it is. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He doesn't bruise the tender reed. If you seek him first in his righteousness, all these things will be provided for you. He has come to give us life and that more abundantly. So those are some qualities of the relationship that there's not time to just dwell on and dwell on found a little blurb on a web page that tried to say something like this about our personal relationship, our salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That it involves trusting fully in Jesus and living to please him. Confessing sins, repenting, yielding self to Jesus. That the Holy Spirit does God's work in and through us. That we try to allow the Holy Spirit to control and direct our lives. And that the results are love, joy, peace, freedom, victory, power, eternal life in heaven. 
as I seek to integrate truthful biblical emphases that are fresh on my mind with what I've experienced and known as a Christian during my life, a verse that is also, you know, noted as a key verse sometimes is in Micah 6, and it's Micah 6, 8. And it says, mankind, he has told you what is good and what, is, and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly or seek justice, to love faithfulness or love mercy, depending on translation, or kindness or steadfast love, and to walk humbly with your God. I feel like this verse touches on those monumental two things that are harmonized in Christ in the sense that it's mentioning justice and it's mentioning love mercy and it's adding that third element of the relationship to walk humbly with our God. Throughout the preparation of this message over more than a week, I think, There's a line in a well-known hymn that's been on my mind. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. So let's go back again for a moment to the greatest commandment. Sometimes lately, correctly, we have said Look how impossible that was to do when we're dead in sin. But praise the Lord, inside the relationship, we, can, we have the success or righteousness of the Savior covering our shortcomings in loving God, and we now have the desire to love God the way He showed us. In relationships... In general, we feel the difference between conditional love and unconditional love that transforms. Let me try to put these next thoughts in a a right or, or best order. Along with that command to love Him with every fiber of our being, we have a verse both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that says, Be holy, for I am holy or be holy because I am holy, or be holy as I am holy. A few years ago, when I was at a certain point in my life with hoping the Lord would show me how to, you know, what job to have to use the skills that he gave me or whatever, I came across a verse that in the NIV is, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. just really want to put this together right and tell something a little bit silly in the process of doing it. We have a little thing at home that mom came up with that's related to some of God's victories in her life, which is that if we've got, it's it's the time of year where the, the yard is covered with pine cones and it looks absolutely insurmountable to pick up all the pine cones, then Mom's coined this notion of 10 pine cones a day. 10 pine cones a day with the attitude of celebrating the 10 pine cones that got done on the way to the goal instead of condemning yourself for how much more there is to do. And I've heard Chris say, this, 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 I'll say this, this kind of mentally and emotionally celebrates the small intentional wins along the way to the big goal. And I've heard Chris say something like, without shame or guilt or fear or condemnation. And I've heard the Christian psychiatrist on the radio say, guilt is an empty raging against yourself for the fact that you weren't better than that. That you weren't better in the way that you should have been. An empty raging... And if anybody is sitting in this congregation today, and I don't know if anybody is, who is outside of the relationship of faith in the Lord Jesus, 
Don't be content to live in an empty raging against self. Or the inability to fix yourself. When you can know the one who loves and forgives and transforms. I was going to try to give some other verses for the confidence that we have against these amazing relational goals that God has given us along the lines of the confidence that the, your yard will eventually be empty of pine cones. <laughs> and I had some. And then this morning, I thought this one was a good one. First Peter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, exclamation point. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. This is in the section that sometimes in your Bibles will be called living hope or praise to God for a living hope. For he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have, to suffer, have, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You've seen again, glory comes up several times. I mean, it's there, it's right there. It's, I've been in John lately and it's so there. And I think sometimes, for some of us who don't always use that word a lot, it, it almost feels... It almost feels heretical in this one sense. We know that all the glory is God's, and it's really hard to think about my, my role in something about glory to God. And, and when Chris is having us study this confession in Sunday school, it was helpful to me to see that one of the articles actually makes a point of saying all the glory is God. We don't add anything to the glory of God. Um, probably a dumb thing to say right this second, but if a, ma if, if a master painter was going to paint a masterpiece and he, he had a jar of brushes and you were one of those brushes, wouldn't you like to be used? For me, as I think of some really far, feel far, sometimes they feel far, some, some, some truly what God expects in his perfection goals. One more sort of word picture here. It, it kind of occurred to me that since I'm not a very good bowler and don't bowl often, and since I pretty much never golf, but sometimes I say play putt-putt, that I know that I want to knock down the pins, but I see those arrows a little closer in front of me. Or I know I want to sink the putt, but on the line to the hole, I see a speck of dust that I think if I can put the ball over top of that speck of dust, that it's going towards the hole. And I think in our relationship with Jesus, our personal walk following relationship with Jesus that he made possible, I think sometimes that we say something as simple as, may I please him today? May I trust him today? Could I be kinder and more forgiving today to please him and imitate him? How would he have me order my day or my priorities? May I be salt and light to somebody today? Could I abide in him today? Could I 
rest in the peace that passes understanding today? Could he help me pray for an enemy today? Let me seek to reconcile today. I'd like to uh, sing a, either a chorus or a verse of a, of a, of a song that's meant to be uh, from inside of faith, from inside the walk. It's our, it's, it, it expresses our feelings for, for folks who are in, inside of faith. I think it's appropriate to Miss Patsy today. And uh, I think it tries to say something to people who are outside of faith and who are stirred. I'll probably pitch it wrong. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. And he made something, and he made something beautiful of my life. I really thought I could sing it. Something beautiful of our lives because he is showing us his beauty and he is graciously involving us in his plan and he is conforming his children to the image of his son. Something beautiful of my life for his glory. (laughs) That's really the end of the message. And now there's an invitation because I've talked about being inside of this relationship of faith in our Lord. And so I just want to give an opportunity to mark any special moment in a relationship with the Lord, with the support of the church family. There's no business that's going to take place in your heart that can't take place in your car, in your home, in your pew. And there's nothing magical about the front of the church. But this relationship with the Lord is so important. And when it starts, you want to share it. You want to be supported in it. And sometimes when you're doing it, you just need some help. Or you have something to celebrate. So if there's some moment in a relationship with the Lord that you want to share in the context of the support of the church family, then we'll do that while Bev plays. Let me just say this, two sections from the Word. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. The scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And also in Matthew 10, that was Romans. Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Just a short time. Come if you wish.
we'll pray and sing our doxology. Lord, thank you for everything that you've done to bring us into a relationship with you. And Lord, work on our wills to agree with you in becoming more like you. In your name we pray. Amen.